Hi, friends. I'm John Kemp, hosting this podcast. Imagine, if you can, a world in which tractor manufacturers don't have any quality control checks in place, and they don't try to produce a higher quality product than the competitor. Instead, each tractor manufacturer, John Deere, Case, New Holland, Kubota, etc., simply try to produce as many tractors as possible to make their tractor the most abundant and sell more tractors than the competition. But they don't check for quality. It's simply about producing volume. It's very difficult for us to imagine a world like that. And yet, that's exactly the worldview that many of us have when we think about crop production. William Albrecht, many years ago, said that we have become incredibly accurate at hitting the bullseye of the wrong target. And what he was referring to is that we don't take quality of output into consideration when we think about our food supply. Peter Diamandis says that without a target, you will miss it every time. In this episode, Sarah Singla will challenge your thinking about the goals that you have for your farm and will describe some goals such as eliminating erosion and producing a high quality outcome as being among the first and most important goals on a farm equal to or perhaps even greater than achieving high yields. I'm here with a farmer and agronomist who is widely respected for her work in no-till and with multi-species cover cropping, farming in southern France on about 250 acres. Sarah Singlas Farm has been no-till since 1980, a period of almost 40 years. Sarah, we're very excited to have you share some of the things that you've been working on. I failed to mention also Sarah is a Newfield Scholar, has looked at farms in many different regions around the world, teaches very widely on how to incorporate multi-species cover cropping into farming operations. So Sarah, we're very excited to have you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, John. Thank you. Perhaps to begin, Sarah, you've done some quite exceptional work on your own farm. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your personal background, and your kind of your farming operation? Okay, so I am a, I am a farmer in the south of France. I've done a study in uh, in agronomy in Montpellier in the south of France. I am an engineer in agronomy, and I took over my grandfather's farm in 2010. So on this farm, we are in no-till since 1980. So it means we are doing no-till and cover crops for almost uh, 40 years. So today on the farm, I grow rye, corn, wet clover, buckwheat. I, I do a lot of cover crops. I grow also canola rapeseed, spring peas, winter peas. And uh, what I'm trying to do is to improve the soil because if I am a farmer, it's because the previous generation has done a very good job for me. So I have to, my duty is to improve the soil for the next generations. That's quite a diversity of different crops that you mentioned. How many different crops are you actually producing to sell? Maybe 10, at least 10. And after when I do uh, cover crops, I put 20 species inside because I want to create a lot of biodiversity and I want to improve the soil biology because we know that the soil fertility is linked, directly linked to the soil biology. And by doing that, I see that I produce more, I produce with less pesticide, less fertilizer, and I uh, can produce twice a year, in fact. Because once you harvest, you see the new cover crop, and this cover crop can be used by animals. I have uh, 40 cows on my field, uh, which are grazing the cover crops during the summer. And I also have uh, 60 hives, so it means that I do a partnership with a beekeeper. This beekeeper is very happy to be on my farm because on the cover crops, I have a lot of flowers and they can help to feed the bees. So when we are farmers, we produce food, but we also have uh, an impact on the biodiversity and on the environment. So you are producing crops and then you're producing beef and you have honey from the honeybees as well. So you have quite a diverse number of income streams coming from the farming operation. In the future, we will see that animals will be back on the farms because we have lost a lot of biodiversity and diversity on the farms. Today, either we do cotton, either we do corn or only beef. But tomorrow, we will go back to what was... uh, By the past, we will have beef, cows, chicken, pigs, everything, because we need animals to improve also the soil fertility. The need to have animals on a farm has been a recurring theme in people that I've spoken with. I find it interesting. You have tremendous diversity of cover crops. And some people might ask, well, if you're growing 10 different crops and 20 different cover crops, don't you think it would be possible to regenerate soil health without livestock on the farm? No, we need livestock. (laughs) Because we often talk about mimicking nature and mimicking the forest system. I agree. 
But if you look at the forest, in a forest you have uh, wild animals. It's not only something with the trees or with the plants. We need animals. And there is something that you will see in the future. It's about the microbiome. It's all the biology you have in your gut, in the soil, in the plants, and so on. And the animal is a part of the microbiome. And there is a link between the soil fertility and the animals. For example, I know one of the farmers, one of my neighbors, he doesn't have any animals. When you look at, at the soil analysis only on the chemical part, the soil analysis is the same as someone else who has animals. But at the end, the results are completely different. And the only difference comes from the biology, which comes from the animals. I see. So the animals are fundamental to changing the soil's microbiome and the biology, which is something that I think yeah, many would agree with. There is biology that happens in the gut of an animal that is then transferred to the soil that can't be replicated. We don't understand fully how to replicate that without having animals in the ecosystem. Yes. For people who, who are not able to have animals at the moment, maybe what they can do would be to use uh, compost manure or microbes that comes from manure and animals. Because I know that not all of the farmers will be able to put animals on the farm, but that could be a solution for them at the beginning. You have quite a diversity of different crops. If you're growing 10 different crops uh, in addition to all the cover crops, do you ever have any moments where your soils are uncovered or are bare that they're exposed to rain and sunlight directly? No, 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 no. <laughs> to me, life, uh, the soil is always covered by living plants. It's not only to have a cover with uh, something which is dead, such as a um, straw of the of the corn, for example, or of the wheat. I need a living plant because if you look at nature, nature is always covered with living plants. And what I also do is to have a perennial crop in my wheat, for example. I don't kill the perennial crop, such as alfalfa. I just suppress it. So when I harvest the wheat or the triticale, the alfalfa comes over. So it means you always have something living on the ground. Don't wait. You don't let the bare soil. Because we know that the, most of the problems we have today in agriculture is directly linked to the fact that we have lost the soil fertility. Can you tell us a little bit about your crop rotation? When you have such a diversity, what does your crop rotation look like? You will be surprised, but uh, I don't have any crop rotation. Because nature... <laughs> We'll figure out what is your rotation at the end. Even if you have a rotation on 12 years, 12 years is uh, it's long because we are human, but for nature, it's only one second. What I would recommend to people is to be inconstant in, uh, in their rotation. I never grow the same crop from one year to the other. So I'm not able to tell you what I'm going to do next year or in two years' time, but what I know is that the crop will be different from one year to the other. Because we have to look at what uh, the market needs. For example, if someone wants buckwheat, because I also do flour for some restaurants, I sell the, the flour of buckwheat. So if I need to do buckwheat, I will do buckwheat. If I need to do wet clover, because there are some people who want wet clover, I will do it. But I'm not able to tell you my rotation is this, 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 this. Because I know that nature will figure out what is my rotation, and then you create problems. So be inconstant. I love that perspective. Hmm. It's great. If you don't want to you be surprised by nature, you must surprise the nature. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so when you have constant crops, you mentioned a few moments ago that by growing such a diversity of cover crops and constantly having crops in the soil, you can use less pesticides and less fertilizer. Yes. Um, how much fertilizer, what fertilizers and what pesticides are you using on your farm? So about the fertilizer, I use uh, nitrogen, I use also phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, micronutrients. And uh, instead of putting P and K, and so phosphorus and potassium uh, with a mineral uh, fertilizer, I use corn manure and sheep manure. Because I think that the P and K, which come from animals, it's way more uh, efficient compared to the mineral P and K. And about the pesticides, so I, I don't use any insecticides. And I use uh, glyphosate and some other products. But I never spray, because in, in France, we are not allowed, we, we don't have any GMO and so on. I never apply glyphosate on my crops. I will use glyphosate if needed in order to stop a cover crop, for example, just before seeding the, the next cash crop. But I use less and less uh, pesticides. Yeah. So, Sarah, you, you have developed a very interesting 
perspective and farming operation, what are some of the memorable moments and the highlights that led you to make different decisions to where you are today? Meeting you, for example, <laughs> because I had the chance to be an field scholar, so I, I travel a lot. I, I went to the USA, to New Zealand, to Australia, to some of the parts of Europe, to Brazil, Argentina. And I have met very insightful people, such as you, Dwayne Beck, uh, people from uh, Lucien Segui also, who, who is in, uh, in South America. And what I've seen is that most of the the farmers who are very efficient, they don't have any tractors or big machinery. First of all, they think. They understand how nature works. They often want to mimic nature and, and to do that. So what I would say to people is go and learn, 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 learn. In Brazil, they say that the, the fact you will be efficient is directly linked to the knowledge you have per square meter. So it means that the, mod, the more knowledge you will have, the more efficiency you will be, the more profitable you will be. And I truly believe in that. The more knowledge you get, the more profitability you will have on your farm. Because the agriculture of tomorrow will be directly linked to the knowledge. And to be a farmer is the most difficult job in the world. Because being a farmer is uh, working with nature. When you work in an office, you don't mind because you close the door and it's finished. Here, we work outside, so we, we don't have any impact on the sun or on the rainfall. Then we have to produce food. We have to respect the environment. We have to have uh, knowledge in agronomy, in uh, husbandry, in mechanics, in uh, accounting, and etc., etc. So it means that tomorrow, we will have, uh, if you want to be a farmer, you will have to go to school. In the past, we used to say, you should go to school, otherwise you will stay on the farm. And today is the reverse. It's if you want to be a farmer, you must go to school. You must go study. I have seen that all around the world. The more knowledge you have, the more profitable your farm will be. Yes, I think that's yes. worth repeating. That's a very powerful statement. Mm. Profitability yeah. is directly linked to the knowledge. So in all of your studies and things that the people that you've spoken with on your travels, what were some of the things that you learned that were unexpected? What was it that surprised you? What surprised me is uh, why are we still plowing today? I, I really I don't understand. There is no point to to see that. In many many countries all around the world, we see, we see people plowing, whereas we know that by uh, touching the soil we will have erosion. We are losing the soil. We are losing the soil fertility. By losing the soil fertility, you lose also the nutrition of the of the plants of the, the animals, and we, we will create a lot of disease on people, because we know that if we want healthy people, we need healthy soils. And I don't know why people are still plowing, because we know the solution to stop erosion, we know the, the solution to, to increase the soil fertility. Why does the government doesn't help us to go on this way, in fact? Interesting. So do you have any insights into... The answer to your question of, of why are we still plowing? Why do you think? It can be linked to many things. It can be linked to the fact that uh, farmers uh, love driving big tractors. Because if you love to drive a big tractor, you will need uh, a plow. If you are in no till, we spend less time on the tractor. It means also that you need to learn. And sometimes people don't want to learn. They prefer to do the same thing every year at the same period, and they don't want to think. And what I would recommend to the governments all around the world would be two things. It's to base the production only on the results. I mean, you do what you want. If you want to plow, you plow. If you want to be in no till, you be in no till. But I want farmers who don't have any erosion in the field. So it's based on, on results. And the other results would be not to have any pesticides in the grain we produce. And when I talk about pesticides, it can be either the synthetic pesticides such as glyphosate or whatever you want, but also natural pesticides. Because we know that nature is not always very nice. Nature produces also uh, disease. By doing that, you will be based only on results. So it means that we, we won't oppose organic farming, conventional farming, and so on. We will gather all the farmers together, and we will look only at the results. I don't mind if you cook your, your fries with a pan, with a... Uh, Whatever you want, what I need is to have something in the plate when I want to eat. I don't mind about the way it was produced. You see what I mean? 
Yeah, I do. Hmm. It will be very powerful because we, we won't oppose the systems. Because at the moment, we know that there are less and less farmers and we are begin, we are doing a big difference between people who are organic, not organic. Do you till? Do you, uh, do you plow? Are you in no till? Et cetera, et cetera. But at the end, we divide everybody. If you have a common goal, the goal is to protect the nature, not to have any erosion, to have clean water and to have uh, nutritional grains at the end. We look at the goal and, and we need so, a big goal to, to change and to move. So you, you've mentioned a, a number of pieces that I want to follow up on. I, I want to speak a bit about erosion and nutritional values. But before we speak about some of those specific pieces, you're focusing on let's identify a goal and let's identify which farming systems get us the results, the optimal results that bring us closer towards that goal. Of course, we know what the general goal is conceptually being healthier for the environment and for ecology, producing more higher quality food for people. From your experience and observations, working with many different farmers in different climates, what are the farming systems that bring better results and how much better can those results be than what is mainstream today? The results would be way more better because you, you will use less pesticide, less fertilizer. You will use, in fact, the power of nature. We will work with nature. Instead of fighting nature, we will work with nature. So I, I didn't say that uh, we don't need anything. We, we will still need to do something because natural agriculture doesn't exist, I would say. Either you let nature, either you do agriculture. So we will still need to choose maybe some cover crops and to grow food. But when you do that, I can promise you, you, you will earn time, you will save money, you will do a lot of savings. For example, when I talk about no-till, for someone who is plowing, he will use a lot of fuel by plowing. He will use a lot of uh, time and he will spend a lot of time on the tractor. If you are in no-till, you, you don't use any fuel. And we also have to think about the fuel consumption because all this machinery is very intensive in uh, fuel consumption. After the fact we have cover crops and uh, different crops all around the year means that we will be able to store a lot of carbon in the ground. So it, will, it means we will uh, be able to mitigate the global warming also. You've mentioned machinery a couple of times. Uh, what machinery do you have on your farm? What tractors and equipment do you have on your farm? So on my farm, <laughs> so I have uh, I run a farm which is 250 acres. And my biggest tractor <laughs> is just an 80 horsepower uh, tractor. So it means you don't need a big machinery to be a good farmer. And about the cedar, I have a single disc opener, a cedar coming from Brazil called Semeato. But to me, in the future, we won't use any cedar anymore. The future of the no-till is to throw the seeds on the ground. Because if you look at nature, nature never puts a seed in the ground, nature let the seeds to they fall on the ground, then they are recovered by uh, the previous crops, and they grow. But I haven't <laughs> I haven't seen nature with a cedar who wanted to seed a tree or whatever you, we want. So in the future we will use that, because if we think about the fuel consumption, the fact you use a cedar, you will do maybe 36 meters. When you have uh, cedars in the USA, for example, or, or three meters, but you, you won't uh, go very fast. Whereas if you fly the cover crops, if you throw them on the, on the ground, I mean, you go very, very fast and you use less fuel and you are more efficient because you don't touch the soil. The more we disturb the soil, the more weeds we have. The less disturbance, the less the weeds. So it means if you have less disturbance, less weeds, you will, you won't have to use herbicide. And the fact we can decrease the herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, it's a consequence of a very well-managed system. To me, it's that. But it's not something you do at the beginning. At the beginning, you will still have to use maybe some of the herbicides and so on. The time you improve your system, but once you have very well-managed the system, you don't use anything. The idea of broadcasting seeds on soil yes. is also an idea that was described in the book Natural Farming and one, the One Straw Revolution, where they yes. described how in natural farming systems, they would simply coat seeds and roll them in a very slight amount of dirt to create these very tiny dirt pellets. Yes. 
And they were doing that not so much for germination and for affecting the seed in the soil, so much as to protect them from birds and to keep the birds from eating them. Yeah, absolutely. And when you look at the past, because my grandfather is still alive, he's uh, 91. And when I talk with him, he told me that by the past, they used to throw the seeds on the ground. There was someone who was on the farm, and his job was to seed by throwing and broadcasting the seeds on the ground. But he told me we didn't have any cedar at the beginning. The cedar appeared after the Second World War or whatever, but at the beginning, they weren't uh, putting the seeds in, in the ground. It's yeah. interesting how we uh, we regain and recapture some of the old knowledge that has been lost and uh, yes. figure out where to where to adapt it into a new system. You again mentioned a moment ago that you're using less pesticides and less fertilizers. How much less fertilizer are you using than other growers in the region? Maybe I know people who are using uh, 250 units of nitrogen for the same yield I am doing, and I use only 120 units. Because if you don't want to disturb the soil too much, the, the amount of nitrogen you should each time is maximum 30 units. And we know that uh, nitrogen fertilizer, the mineral nitrogen, is more harmful than uh, compared to glyphosate on the soil uh, microbiology. I know that there are some people who say you can cut all the fertilizer or whatever you want, but there are some places in France and even in the world where we have uh, soil very, very degraded. I mean, no organic matter content and whatever we want. So at the beginning, we still uh, need to put a little of uh, fertilizer in order to grow good crops. And by having good crops, then you, you will increase the, the organic matter content and also this quality. Slowly by slowly, you can decrease the nitrogen uh, use, but don't cut everything at the beginning. Yeah, so you're, you're in effect producing equivalent yields of, of a corn crop with 50% of the nitrogen application. Yes, Do you yes. believe you'll be able to reduce that even further in the future? Yes, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so because I think that in the future, as the soil is improving and uh, by having legumes, I will be able to, to use less and less nitrogen. And what I, I told you uh, earlier is, to also to give complete nutrition uh, program with manganese, sulfur, copper, uh, all the micronutrients. Because we have a lot of nitrogen already in the air. 78% of the air that we breathe is composed of uh, nitrogen. So it means normally <laughs> we wouldn't have to put nitrogen on the ground, such as the spiridium and whatever we, we want, but that are able to convert this nitrogen into nitrate and ammonium in the ground. This is actually something that we've been able to observe with many of the farms that we have worked with here in the U.S. is we've been able to, in a single year or in 18 months, reduce nitrogen applications, in some cases, as much as 50 to 70 percent and still maintain yields. And reducing it by 70 percent in one year is exceptional. But I would say by working with trace minerals, working with biology, I think on every farm we've ever worked on, we've been able to reduce it by 30% in the first year with a yield gain and not a yield loss. I completely agree with you. Yeah. When we are farmers, in fact, our job, if you look at uh, old books, old agricultural books, the job of the farmer is how do I feed the soil to feed the plants, to feed the cows or the sheep or whatever you want, to feed people. But today, we have forgotten the soil. or feeding plants, but we are not feeding the soil to feed the plants. But our job is, is that, well, in, in French, we say cultivateur, and cultivateur means to feed the soil, the etymology of the, of the word uh, farmer. When you think about feeding the soil, your, your response earlier when I asked you what is something that has surprised you, you said you don't understand why we are still plowing, because that is the opposite. I mean, the effects of plowing soil and facilitating erosion is the exact opposite of feeding the soil and, and what you are describing the role of a farmer to be. When, when we think about erosion, I don't know the exact statistics and data for many different states within the country here in the U.S., but I know that the state of Iowa loses two pounds of topsoil for every pound of corn that is produced. It's an incredible number when you stop to think about it, um, because it means that in essence, in effect, the more that they're producing with tillage systems, etc., the more soil that they are losing. Yes. And it's also tillage and touching the soil, because I see some of the farmers say, okay, I stopped plowing, but they will use uh, discs 
ten times. And to me, they do more damage than just one pass with a plow. So it's touching the soil. That we, we don't need to touch the soil. Nature doesn't work with iron. Nature works with root system, with living roots, but not, not with machinery. And today, when we talk with farmers, we are more specialists of the machinery we use than about the soil biology we need to feed. So in addition to the pieces that we've talked about, what is something that you believe to be true about modern agriculture that is very different from the mainstream view? What I believe which is true is that if the if you have healthy soil, you will have healthy plants, you will have healthy people. And what we look at in agriculture is only the yield. But I hope that in the future, we won't look at the yield, but at the quality of the food. We want nutrition food in order to have healthy people. A lot of diseases are created because we are lacking nutrients in the food. So we need high-dense nutrient food. I think the idea of having healthy soils to grow healthy plants, to produce healthy food so that we can have healthy people, it's a common thread and theme in the area of regenerative agriculture. But something that seems to me hasn't been well described at this point is how can we grow healthy crops without using large amounts of soil amendments and remineralizing our soils. Do you have any thoughts on that? With biology. Because what is a soil? A soil without biology, it's not a soil, it's geology. So if you have geology with, <laughs> uh, <laughs> with chemistry, for example, you put uh, nitrogen, whatever you want, if you have a lack of biology, you won't do anything. What converts geology into a soil? It's the biology. And today we know that we are using more and more biological products in order to restore a kind of soil fertility. But biology is, in fact, when we talk about soil fertility, soil fertility is linked to the biology, is linked also to what you said, it's about the nutrients. We need to have uh, all the nutrients available for the plants. And also we need the physics, which is the porosity. Because if you have the, the porosity and the microporosity, you will be able to have the aerobic bacteria and the microbiology, which is very powerful. Each time you lose the, the porosity, you are in anaerobic conditions, which means you don't have any oxygen. So instead of having the good bacteria, you will have the, the bad ones. But the soil fertility is linked to these three things, porosity, biology, and the chemistry. There is this idea that we need to have healthy soil to produce healthy plants, which is true. You described it perfectly. The question becomes, well, if you don't have a healthy soil, how do you develop a healthy soil? And the key, I believe, to producing an extraordinarily healthy soil is to grow a really healthy plant, to grow a really healthy crop, to grow cover crops, etc., and to rebuild that biology with plants. It's really plants that create healthy soil equally as much or perhaps even more so than a healthy soil creates healthy plants. It's a self-perpetuating system that we need to manage. I agree, because it's the plants that will feed the biology with the sugars coming from the, the photosynthesis. All the roots exudate our sugar coming directly from photosynthesis. It's what Christine Jones, she's a researcher in Australia, she calls that the liquid carbon, sugar coming from the photosynthesis that will feed the biology. And that's also how you build sort of organic matter, that is how you sequester carbon. We've observed some extraordinary gains in soil organic matter. And when many plants, particularly during the vegetative stage, can contribute as much as 50% or more of their total carbon production out through the root system as root exudates. And that's a very large quantity. But that only happens when you have healthy plants. If you don't have healthy plants, they don't have that surplus of carbohydrates to send into the soil profile. Sarah, what is a book or a resource that you recommend to farmers frequently? The first to read is uh, Dirt from uh, David Montgomery. is to understand that we must take care of the land, of the soil. Because we know that by losing the soil, we lose the civilizations. We are creating desert. So start with that. And then after you will learn more things about physiology in agriculture, agronomy, whatever you want. But First, be aware that our main tool of production is the soil, and that if we don't manage the soil very well, we are just destroying everything for the next generations. 
The soil is the most important thing in agriculture. Yeah, without soil, then uh, everything everything collapses. Collapse. Yeah, everything collapses. Egypt, Iraq, Iran, all these places. We come from these places at the beginning, but today they are just desert. Uh, we see that they don't have anything to have in the plates. They live in desert. Why? It's because we have destroyed the soil. But by this time, I don't blame them because they didn't know how to regenerate the soils. But today, it's very powerful because we know how to regenerate the soils. It's the first time in all the civilization's history that we know how to regenerate soils. And we're doing that by having healthy plants on the, on the soil. Sarah, we've, we've spoken about a number of different topics, which I find very intriguing. And I'm certain that our listeners will as well. The, the last question that I have for you is... What is the question you wish I would have asked? What is a topic that you would still like to talk about that we haven't spoken about yet? At the moment, I think we have talked about uh, many things. Maybe some of the other topics, it's uh, how to do cover crops, uh, what will be the future, or what will be the goal uh, we will have to, <laughs> to decide for agriculture. So let's speak a bit more about cover crops for just a moment, because I, I didn't dive into that as deeply as I might have. If I understood you correctly, you said you're growing as much as 20 different species of yes. cover crops. How many species do you have in uh, in a single mix that you apply? At least you have 20. Number, at fact, least 20 in each mix. Yes, yes. But at le- in fact, I have done some uh, research studies, and the, the minimum is five to six. After each time you you go up to five to six species in a mix, you it doesn't mean you will have a, a good um, a good cover crop. It just means that you are sure that one function will be ensured in the soil. I mean, for example, if you put a radish and mustard and a Chinese radish, you will do only one thing: is to create holes in order to help the water to enter the soil. But the radish won't replace the veg. The radish won't replace. The peas, the, the veg and the peas, they will bring nitrogen because they are legumes. So we need at least one grass, one uh, things like a radish, and then one uh, legume. Because we need to produce nitrogen, we need to dig holes with this wood system, and then we need also to have a crumble structure. And the only way to have a crumble structure is by putting uh, grass in the field such as rye, uh, cereal rye, uh, pretty kale, whatever you want, or sun hemp, or uh, sorghum, or corn. You can use that also in, uh, in cover crops. And when, when we do cover crops, because often farmers tell me, what should I do after my corn? What should I do after the wheat and so on? The question is, what will be the next cash crop? And by doing that, you will make the difference between the summer cover crop and the winter cover crop. The summer cover crop will be seeded right after the, in July, and it will be seeded prior to a winter cash crop. For example, wheat or rye or whatever you want. And the winter cover crop will be seeded in October prior to a corn or soybean. But if we don't use the same species in the summer cover crop and in the winter cover crop. Sarah, as as you work with these different cover crops, develop these blends, I'd love to hear a bit more about your actual farming operation itself. What have you experienced on your farm or what have you observed on your farm that was a delightful surprise? For example, to have the living alfalfa in the in the cereals because you don't have to seed anything and you see that the, the alfalfa will come back after the harvest of the wheat. So it means the soil is already covered by a living plant. You don't have to wait for two or three weeks in order to have the cover crop which grows. After what I've seen is that by having the the more biomass you get, the more wood system you have, the better the soil biology and the better will be the result on the next cash crop. If you succeed with your cover crop, you will have success with the cash crop. And if you don't have a good cover crop, sometimes there are failures on the cash crop. The key thing is, is really the cover crop for me. So can you describe for us a little bit when, when you are growing wheat on perennial alfalfa, how do you manage the alfalfa before you plant wheat? Or how do you so keep I, the alfalfa from becoming dominant? I suppress the alfalfa when I seed the wheat. Then they grow together during the autumn. Then in the beginning of the spring, I spray again the alfalfa just to suppress it with a normal. And if needed, I suppress it again in uh, April or May in order not to have a uh, competition between the wheat and the alfalfa. And it's also because I want to harvest only the wheat. Otherwise, you have some troubles. 
because you have the alpha alpha with the wheat together, and when you want to harvest, it's a, it's a nightmare, in fact. Yeah, you're suppressing the alpha alpha with hormone applications to keep yes. it short. Yes, but yeah. small doses, not full doses. Otherwise, you kill you kill it. Just to small doses to suppress. You don't want to kill. You just want to slow it down. Yeah, wonderful. Can't think of any other questions that I have for you at the moment. Very great discussion, Sarah. Thank you very okay. much for sharing. Yes, okay, of course. And thank you for doing that because I think you, you help people to know more and more and more because we're not able to travel and to be everywhere. By doing that, you can stay at home and, and listen to people. So you're doing a very good job. Yeah. Well, thank you. Very pleased to talk with you again. <laughs> yeah, and I hope so. Day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. This podcast was brought to you by a great company that I work for, AEA, Advancing Eco Agriculture the leader in regenerative agriculture since 2006. At AEA, we believe in challenging the status quo to find more profitable and regenerative ways to grow crops. We also believe that healthy plants are resistant to pests and disease, and that to grow healthy plants, we must first think differently about agriculture, about empowering life instead of suppressing life, about regeneration instead of degeneration. To achieve this, We formulate and sell products that help growers produce higher quality yield with less risk of crop failure. In short, we help growers make more money with less risk. Thank you for listening.